This is the October meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. The first order of business uh, gives me a great deal of pleasure, and that is to introduce our new interim superintendent, uh, Connie Goldman. Connie brings to this job an impress impressive set of credentials. Uh, she holds a doctorate in education from Harvard University. She holds a master's degree from the University of Maine and an undergraduate degree from St. Joseph College. Connie most recently was the interim, the superintendent uh, at Gorham, a uh, post from which she recently uh, retired, uh, theoretically to write and study and reflect on her experiences. But uh, we were very fortunate to be able to lure her away from that uh, idyllic existence. And uh, she also brings uh, some impressive credentials in another area, in two areas. Uh, she is a resident of Cape Elizabeth, a longtime resident, a former teacher. Four of her boys graduated from Cape Elizabeth High School. So not only does she bring her education and her experience, but also an intimate knowledge of our school system and the important task of parenting and educating our children. Connie, we all welcome you. Thank you. We look forward to your leadership. I've never, in the brief time that I've known you, I uh, ever would be surprised if you didn't put it that way. Yeah, well, everybody who knows me knows that I'm usually not at a loss for words, but I do appreciate that introduction. And I do also want to say I appreciate the uh, very warm welcome I have received from uh, former colleagues and also people who didn't know me uh, before when I was working here. Uh, obviously, I think, I hope you all realize that we see this as, a, as an excellent school system and it's a pleasure for me to be here, if only for a short period of time. I do want to say just one quick thing about being a superintendent. Uh, when I was here before, I was a teacher. Um, I regard myself as a teacher in this role and I think that uh, sometimes people wonder just in fact what a superintendent is supposed to do. We are a facilitator of good teaching. So in working with the board, that will be certainly my primary goal. Thank you. Thank you. The next order of business uh, are adjustments to the agenda. Uh, one adjustment that uh, I would like uh, to make would be to move the uh, formal signing of the contract with the cafeteria workers uh, to, to be the next item on the agenda so that the president of the association uh, who's been on the premises uh, teaching and coaching and working since 7 o'clock can go home. Uh, do any board members have uh, adjustments to the agenda? Mr. Chairman, I wish to address a... Um, I lost it here. Is that the drug program certification? Yes, yeah. Perhaps I can just okay. fill in there. Um, the issue of drug program certification requirement for drug-free schools funds. This is an issue that came up this summer. The State Department uh, is a sort of flow through for some federal funds and federal requirements require assertion from each school board that they have a certain set of policies on how they deal with uh, drug issues in the schools and with uh, not only with students but also with employees. Ease. Um, and in fact, the, uh, I understand this summer there was some review of those policies. You do have most of them or you have pieces of them, uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Greer was kind enough to inform me that in his conversations with the teachers who were involved with this, we're reminded that we will have to spend some time this, uh, during the school year reviewing those policies and make sure that they are in proper order. So uh, you did have a piece of information in your packet. Uh, very general information, and you will be hearing more about that later. So should we put it on the agenda or for, uh, let's say, under new business, yes, item D? Yes, I have a recommendation okay. to address that. Okay. We'll, we'll put it on then at that point. Right. Okay. Are there any other adjustments uh, from the board? Are there any uh, items that uh, the public would like to add to the uh, agenda this evening? Um, seeing none, we'll move on to the next. Sorry. 
Uh, if you could tell me your name and the subject you'd wish to address and uh, how long it would take, uh, uh, I will place it on the agenda at, at an appropriate uh, point. Okay. I think we'll put that in here. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll add that to the new business, uh, which is it'll become item E. Okay, let me uh, point out before we proceed that. Uh, the business manager is not here tonight because unfortunately his mother died uh, and um, so he, we will not have a business manager's report uh, at this time. The next, uh, sure, go ahead. The next item is the approval of the school board minutes of the September 11th and September 28th meeting. I understand uh, that we have uh, several small corrections, Charlie. Actually, Mr. Chairman, we have just one. Under the September 11th meeting, under our, uh, item number 11, budget adjustments, um, under the third paragraph, uh, Charles Greer's seconded Mr. Holt's motion, but with a change in the wording of the motion to move that a portion of the $51,455, Mr. Greer explained that, and the correction needs to be in the next amount, which is as 52.455, so it should be 51.455. Thank you. Any other corrections to the minutes? That is all. Anybody else? Okay, I'd entertain a motion that the minutes be approved as amended. I move to approve the minutes as okay. amended. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Minutes are approved. The next item are comments by, uh, is comments by the, the high school and middle school representatives. This is the first time that the middle school representatives have uh, been before the school board and we welcome you uh, and because this is the first time we're going to let you go first. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jeff uh, Sarbeck and uh, Rachel Wald. I'm Jeff Sarbeck and this is Rachel Wallace. Um, first, we'd just like to introduce our new student council members. And um, I'm the new president, Jeff Sarbeck. Our co-vice presidents are John Quayley and Chad Collins. Our new secretary is Shauna Stevens. Our new treasurer is Andrew Fisher. Um, Corey Kessler is the new historian. Um, and Rachel is a new school board representative. Uh, this year we have six reps, two from each class. The eighth grade representatives are Lynn Powers and Betsy Roberts. Seventh grade representatives are Kelly Allen and Lauren Carter. And the sixth grade representatives are Jamie Mooney and Jen Lyman. Um, first order of business at our meeting for our first dance is going to be on October 19th. Our DJ is um, Chuck Brady. The price of the tickets is $3 and before us, three and at the door it's 3.50. Um, it dates from 7 to 10. And um, also, I'd like to mention that our, the eighth graders are back in Mrs. Hall and Mrs. Hannah's class, room uh, 211A, and because uh, they ripped out a wall. And we had been held in the library for a while. <coughs> and also, the sixth grade class received 150 pumpkins donated by the regional waste system through the effort of this is Lori Kirstein, and the person who donated them is John Party. Okay, and I'm Rachel Walls, and we'd like to welcome Superintendent Goldman. Um, middle school students, um, we wanted to let you know, would like um, to participate in discussions about programs offered or changed 
and um, would like, if at all possible, to attend budget meetings and be included in discussions. <clears throat> Sales of the Chiwanki gift wrap paper um, raised $11,690. Um, that's for the sixth grade class's trip to Chiwanki. Um, 28 students sold over 350, um, 10 students sold over 250, and about 50 students sold $100, give or take a little. Um, at this point, each student will probably have to pay about $60. Um, let me see. Okay, um, open house was very accessible, successful and many parents attended. Um, and October 3rd, Mike Katarina, a representative of the NASA program, met with students um, grades four through eight and gave us a little journey through space thing. Um, and as you know, fall sports are coming to an end later this month and winter sports will be starting. And well, our eighth grade trip is on the agenda for Salem. And um, also, um, students were wondering when the construction outside the portable would be completed so that students can go from one building to the other outside. Um, we were told that there might be a pavement or a walkway made, and we were just wondering when that would be done. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Rachel, uh, with regard to your point about uh, the budget meetings, uh, we hope you will come. Uh, you, the students, and uh, the public have always been uh, welcome at uh, the budget meetings. What's happened in the last couple of years, in my experience, is that only a few people come in the beginning when we do all the work, and then when the work is finished uh, and the result is known, then a lot of people take uh, an interest in it. And that's certainly understandable, but we on the school board would like your input much earlier, and I uh, hope you and the public, uh, parents, teachers, anybody who would like to come to these sessions will certainly be welcome. <coughs> now, having adjusted the agenda a little while ago for the benefit of the president of the, uh, the Teachers Association, I didn't write it down, but I would now like to uh, interrupt the, uh, the comments uh, of the students and uh, invite Mr. Boothby to come forward and sign the agreement with the cafeteria workers on behalf of the uh, Cape Elizabeth uh, Teachers Association. Connie, Connie Brown, do you have the execution copies for us to sign? Oh, John. Okay. <coughs> I was always a good secretary, Connie. I'll put you in my office. Oh. Well, we'll uh, we'll just reverse it. Do they get the same take a cup? They get, yes. They get rid of the numbers and you don't want it. <laughs> Just went to the file. <laughs> High school representatives. I'd first like to, um, on behalf of the entire high school, I'd like to welcome the new superintendent, and we look forward to working with you. Um, let's see. At issue in Cape Elizabeth High School, let's see. The Pledge of Allegiance, which isn't any long, is no longer set in, in the high school. We're trying to, to get it set again, I guess, to, to a lot of time in the school schedule so that we might be able to 
to pledge the allegiance. Um, at our SAC field trip, we went to uh, Little Diamond Island, and we were surveyed. I'm not sure where the results are in that, but as soon as we find out, we'll, we'll find out whether or not how students feel about it. So, um, as I said, the SAC had a retreat on Little Diamond Island on let's see, September 27th. We took a ferry over, and we spent the entire day. We cooked lunch, and we had breakfast, and then we broke down into committees, sort of designating what we were <coughs> going to decide to do for the year. Uh, one of the committees was was going to sponsor a, a faculty luncheon, which is going to be October 17th. Last year, we did a, an appreciation dinner for the faculty. And since October 17th is a half day, we thought that we'd do a luncheon. It would be a little more convenient for everyone. And the Winter Carnival, which hasn't really had as much spirit as we had hoped in the past, we were hoping to combine it with Earth Week this year, because Earth Week worked well last year. And students really got involved with it. So. We're going to work on combining those two things this year. We've also begun a, a committee to hopefully We've also begun a committee to hopefully get a salad bar in the high school as well, because the middle school has had a salad bar for, I think, two years now, and students have been talking about that for a while. And also, we've, we've begun talking about a process in which, t in which students can evaluate their teachers and would like to see students getting a little bit more input in their classes. So we set up a committee to see um, if evaluations could be done to, to give some ideas to teachers about what, what would be better liked and what might, might work well in their classes. On September 15th, um, a dance was held which was co-sponsored by the SAC and the community team. And it was very successful. It was run much like last year's last chance dance in that the community team and the student advisory council worked together and um, letters were sent out to parents informing them of when the dance would be and asking for their help in making it a chemical free occasion. And um, there was a, a lot of turnout and we're hoping to do more in the future. And I'd also like to publicly thank the community team for all their support in getting our dances back and we're looking forward to working with them again. Thank you very much. The uh, next item on the agenda is the interim superintendent's report. Connie? Thank you. Um, first of all, I must say compliment both sets of students. It's a really, I think, positive move for uh, you to be here. Board meetings are sometimes uh, long, tedious, and not exactly the most exciting game in town. But uh, I think understanding that people have serious business to talk over and can, in fact, move through an agenda is, is a good experience for you, and we certainly enjoy listening to you. I do not know about the walkway. I guess I have to find out about it. And um, let me see. Salad bar doesn't sound too tough. Maybe we can <laughs> do something about that. I don't know about the, uh, the uh, Red Book on Teachers, but, you know, certainly is something to talk about. Um, and Earth Day in, in Winter Carnival sounds great, except that I hope you're not expecting not to have any snow. <laughs> so that uh, I assume that that's Earth in the larger global sense. Uh, sounds good. <laughs> well, so many Winter Carnivals uh, get scrubbed as Winter Carnivals because there isn't any snow. This will be the year for snow, no doubt. Uh, the reports, obviously, since I haven't been here long enough to generate too much of a report strictly on my own, uh, I am fortunate we have the administrators here to actually carry the ball. Frank Miles will be talking about the 11th grade assessment scores. And I think I'll ask Frank to summarize that for you. The uh, scores that we're talking about are the results of testing done by the current senior class when they were juniors last March, the so-called 11th grade MEA assessment scores. Um, the, the scores, I don't think at this point, are um, a secret. They've been widely reported in, in the press, but I will um, briefly summarize them. Um, 
for the viewing public that may not know what they are. Um, their scores are in six areas, reading, writing, mathematics, science, social studies, and humanities. In reading, the score is 335 out of a possible 400. In writing, it's 400 out of 400. In mathematics, it's 350 out of 400. In science, it's 355. In social studies, it's 400. And in humanities, it's 395. The scores are lower than last year when we achieved 400 on four of six, but the scores are really quite good and quite respectable. The only score that is, if you will, lower than its comparative uh, band of similar towns or school systems is the reading score, which is a little bit lower um, than that band would be. Uh, that would really be 345. It would extend from 345 to over 400, and, and we're at 335. Um, I'm not sure that one can account for a, a drop in a particular score um, in any given year, nor can we really account for any reason for increasing. Um, the, the predictable um, average, uh, the, the cumulative average score for Cape Elizabeth, for example, in reading has been 365 over the five years that we've been doing this. Um, and so we're, we're lower than that cumulative average. Um, in several of these, uh, in reading, math, and science. Uh, we're higher in writing, social studies, and humanities. Um, so I'm not sure that this <coughs> proves a great deal. What's most interesting, I think, for the faculty, all of whom have been given uh, complete copies of this, of this report, is to look at the individual subject scores as they break down and, and look at particular items none of which I think are particularly noteworthy for the general public, but which may be useful for the faculty in looking at their program. If we look at the scores as a whole, however, I think there are a couple of areas that are of uh, consistent concern for us. Uh, one is the gender bias of, of our scores that we've noticed not only in the high school scores, but also um, was this whole issue of gender bias was discussed at the board workshop in September on the fourth grade testing scores. And what we're talking about here is the difference between male and female scoring on reading and writing and on math and science. Um, as the comparative scores on a chart that I've given the board show, if, if I go back over five years, uh, generally speaking, girls do better on the reading and the writing, and the boys do better on math and science. And uh, this is not always so, but it's so frequently enough that it's somewhat puzzling to us. I, I'm not sure that the, that the fact that there is a difference is so puzzling as the amount of the difference. Um, there seems to be some national data that supports the fact that um, women are frequently better at reading and writing and men are frequently better in math and science. But in terms of individual performance or in terms of the size of that gap, it's sometimes puzzling as to why in any given year it's larger or smaller. Uh, I, I think that th the high school is trying to address that in a couple of ways. We're trying to be more supportive of our young women in, in both math and science, and our faculty, I think, are increasingly able to demonstrate that women can do well in math and science. Uh, we have a number of women math teachers and science teachers. I think that's an important um, asset for our, for our high school, which um, has um, a number of young women who are interested in science, and we certainly try in our career fairs to um, illustrate for, for uh, the girls in the school that, in fact, there are some very interesting careers in math and science, and that they, we hope, will become more interested in that um, and, and look at it more favorably. Um, and I think it's uh, sometimes puzzling as to why we, we sort of ask, is there a cultural bias? Or we, we, you know, we're sort of puzzled by that. In any case, that's something we're, we're sort of tracking from year to year. Uh, another thing that is, I think, more interesting this year is um, the test results um, have indicated that there's a, a difference really between the way the students who on the test identify themselves as college prep 
students and those who identify themselves as non-college preparatory students do on these tests. That is to say, the students who identify themselves as college preparatory students uh, consistently seem to score much higher than the non-college prep students. Indeed, in, in Cape Elizabeth, in most years, as the other chart shows you, most of the college prep students um, achieve 400s or very close to them in, in the test scores. The college preparatory students do not, but in, in a year like a uh, year before last, or excuse me, last year, uh, when I reported on the class that graduated in June, um, the, the non-college bound students in that class, or those who identify themselves as non-college bound students, uh, did a, a significantly stronger job on, those, on the tests uh, in their junior year than has been typical in Cape Elizabeth. As a result, that seems to account in large part for the, the four out of six 400s that we had. So that what seems to be driving the rise and fall of our test scores is really a small number of students in our school and, I, and it's of concern to me and concern to the faculty because I think we <coughs> believe we are not doing as strong a job as we should for those students. That is, we do not have perhaps the programs that interest them as much and perhaps we're not doing uh, as much as we could or should um, f for those students in some of the most important, I would say, basic skills. Now, it's interesting that there's been a lot of publicity of this recently. Uh, it, it, it coincidentally, um, as I read through these scores in September, um, somebody called this discrepancy to my attention. About a week later, there was a big newspaper article um, about the, the state's concern in the same direction. And in the papers uh, in the last few days, there's been a, a considerable discussion of the common core of learning that the state is pushing because the state is also concerned about this discrepancy, which happens to be one that's statewide. That there is, in most high schools, this discrepancy between those who identify themselves as college bound and those who identify themselves at, as non-college bound. And the, the difference in results is, um, significant in most, most high schools. And so that I think one of the, the pushes that is going to go on in, in not only in this high school in Cape Elizabeth, but also in the state, is to somehow address the problems of the curriculum for those students who identify themselves as non-college bound. I, I, I stress that because there is a question on the test which they check off as to, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of sociological data that they, that they answer on the test about, parents, um, college education, high school education, et cetera. And, and this is one of those uh, sociological data questions that they identify themselves in a particular way. Um, okay, I think that I'll stop and let you ask me questions if you have some, and uh, we'll take it from there. Have you, yeah. com have you compared uh, their eighth grade scores with their eleventh grade scores. Yeah, I, I have I have looked at the eighth grade scores um, in terms of the college and non-college, or in terms of the gender bias. I, I, yeah. According to their numbers, eighty percent of them took this as eighth graders. That's here. right, and and in fact, in, in in eighth grade, both boys and girls I think got four hundreds on the math. There was a distinction between the the the, the science where the so boys girls scored. Have dropped about 150 points between the, the girls have dropped grade. significantly in the math relative to the boys um, since then, and I think that um, uh, actually I, I can't say that for this class. I tried to find that data for this class and. I, for a copying problem or copying error, I don't have that, that page of that report, which I did copy from Lyle. I did look at the next year, the next two years, in fact, and our eighth grade girls and boys are scoring roughly 400s on the math. I don't know for this class exactly what their math score is. I think that would be interesting yeah. to compare. I do too, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's probably pretty, pretty close and pretty high for both of them, in that there is a problem there. Um, and I think that the, the math, departments in both the high school and the middle school have made a significant change in curriculum uh, this year with the introduction of two new, uh, of some new texts at two levels and they'll introduce them at two more levels next year um, trying to phase in this new program at, from the University of Chicago uh, because again I think the math department is concerned about this um, sort of difference in the performance and, and quite puzzled because there's some you know, there's really no reason that we can account for it 
in terms of uh, looking at, at the ability of our students. In the handout you just gave us, I noticed under the gender breakdown mm -hmm. that, especially in the math and science, the, the girls seem to flip-flop back and forth each year. One year they're up, next year they're down. One year they're up, next year they're down. That's, that's true. And I, I cannot account for that in the educational program that they're, they're receiving so much as to say that is simply, I think, reflects uh, s some strengths of some of the individual students in the, in the classes. Um, when you have a sample of 100 students, um, a few students, a change in the behavior of a few students can affect those numbers fairly, fairly quickly. What would it look like if you did a three-year moving average? Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting. I, I, again, I think that, that what, what Mr. Greer has pointed out is going is to show up, that, that, that on, in, on a couple of years, the girls are scoring above the moving average. Um, and in other years, they're going to be either on it or, or slightly below it. I'm going to guess. Um, but, but the effect of two or three students uh, would be diminished if you use three or five your moving averages. Um, could well be. I'm not a statistician, so I'm going to uh, go with what you what, with your with your point on that, Mr. Leslie. But I, I'd be glad to do it. Uh, I'm not a statistician either. No, right? but I, I, it would be interesting to me because I, I'm curious for the same reason. That is, I've looked at these figures uh, quite a lot and sort of said, why is it that, for example, last year the girls in math um, scored 386, um, and this year they scored 278. Uh, likewise, in 1987, the girls were 346. The following year, they were 292, and so on and so forth. And I'm not quite sure why we have this up and down pattern. Did I? Excuse me. Right. Jan. Uh, I was just going to ask about the writing. Is the writing basically the same as the fourth grade MEA test where they get a particular subject they have to write about? They get two different questions. Part of the group gets one question, part of the group gets the other question. There's no choice for the students who get the booklet. That is, whatever their booklet has, they do. And there is a, a discrepancy in the writing score between um, those who had one kind of writing exercise and the other. But in fact, in general, they write very well. The high, the, I mean, the high school writing scores have been consistently uh, very high, um, particularly in the last uh, two years. And the girls have been consistently high always. Whereas if you look from 86, there were 400, 87, 400, 88, 394, and 89 and 90, 400. So that, um, and the boys really have, um, the last two years, been um, 382 and 400. So I think the writing is very strong. Um, I think some of the... the I think there's some very interesting questions at the end of the report, which really almost too long to go into in great detail, but I, uh, I think the various departments will find some interesting questions there about uh, the amount of writing or the kind of writing or connections between problems in class and problems in real life, um, ways of learning. There's some very interesting um, data uh, that the departments, I think, will find interesting food for thought and to reflect upon both the, the way they teach and s some of the uh, the kinds of curriculum that they may th consider implementing um, and I think that for example in the math in the math curriculum one of the strengths I think of the new program that the math department um, in, in both the middle school and the high school and with the help of the curriculum director have implemented is one that that um, tries to develop connections in, in the problems that are in the math curriculum with r real life, other classes, um, and so on and so forth. They're trying to really broaden the kind of math, math program. So one would hope that in a couple of years, if students were to get the same questions, we would see a difference in their answers. Mr. Chairman, um, I, you've addressed the one concern I had before I came to this meeting, and that was the 15% of, of non-college prep students and they seem to score lower than the state average. And I just hope we aren't losing those students. And, that, and you seem to be going to address that situation. Very much so. We've, we've got a, a, a number of interested uh, 
faculty last spring who began to get concerned about that and this fall there's a um, I think a, a large number of faculty are concerned about um, all of the students in the school but particularly that we address some of our curricular needs there and, and again it's, it's it's it reflects a statewide concern and I think it's where the commissioner is coming from in her defense of the the Common Core I make no great defense for that although I'm interested in it um, but I, I th uh, that is, I'm not wanna, I don't want to plug her, her common core for, from her point of view, but I think she, she may be exactly right that it's a problem that we have to address for all students, um, that we need some essential skills and some essential learning for all of our students. And then we need some very specific programs which are as interesting to students who are choosing not to go to college as college seems to be to the students who want to go to college. Actually, it looks like 90% are planning to go to at least two years of college and 85 percent to four yeah. years and, and then four more percent to a trade school so yeah it, it a very small percentage is planning to go into the workforce immediately after high school so i'm not sure where that breaks down whether it was four-year college or or any college at all but the at least the perception by the students is that they're planning to go on to further education What, what page are you, are you? Um, just a minute. This is the questionnaire. I think it's maybe on the last page, page under career 15. education. Oh, I see. 85% right. are planning to go to four-year colleges, 5% are planning to go to two-year colleges. Yes, I see what you mean. 4% are planning to go to trade or vocational yeah. school. So that's, it's the, a very, very, mm -hmm. Small right. The, the numbers that, that to I took the, the scores from are on a, one of the first subgroup pages where it, it simply breaks them down into two categories. Um, in any case, it's a concern and we're working on it. I just want to be sure you're saying that these are going to the different departments. Yes. And some time will be spent in those departments looking at the yes. that the students wrote. Yeah. Not, For instance, 90 percent said that the teacher talks all the time in class. Right. I mean, the, they, they might be surprised that that's the perception, but it seems like that would be helpful to right. know. I'm going to sit down with each department. Uh, I've begun to, to do this with, with the English department first at just a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to, to work my way through all the departments in school and look at these results with each department. Um, the, um, I don't want to, I think it's important that, that we understand that we are not necessarily going to try to teach to this test. On the other hand, there's some very interesting results of this test that make us reflect on what we do teach. And I think that that's how the test can be most useful to us. One, one more thing. I sure. would like a comparison between eighth grade, not student by student, but just no, generally. I'd be glad to get that for you. Thank you. All right. You're, uh, yes, I'll pass <laughs> you down the gavel for, uh, no, no. The, uh, for your section of the meeting. Yes. Right. You orchestrate the section. Thank you, uh, Mr. Miles. I think uh, I have been listening to MEAs now in another community and also uh, listening to a lot of the dialogue about these tests um, on a statewide basis. I might point out that it would be interesting to know how many girls are taking uh, the advanced math courses. Of course, you have some matrix sampling in there. I suppose it would show up some of those things. Um, I don't expect any answers right now, but I, I know that these tests are so sensitive because of the matrix sampling uh, way in which they are done that actually two or three answers can be surprisingly um, impact your, your scores. And, and your student body, of course, is rather small given the size of high schools throughout the state. So that all of those things are factors and that um, you know those those are very solid scores <laughs> there are many school systems and many school boards that would be like to do, see those well, one one thing to, to to follow that up one of the interesting things both to to one of the physics instructors and to me was the enrollment of girls in the current senior class last year when they were juniors in the in one of the advanced physics courses and there were very few I think like two uh, and there were 30 boys in this particular senior class. Um, and that was puzzling to, to Mr. Weatherby, who teaches this particular set of classes, 
This year, in fact, in the current junior class, the enrollment's about 50-50. So again, that's, you know, to go back to why is it up, why is it down, I think that to some degree has uh, to do with the students in the particular classes and their, their perceived strengths to themselves and what their interests are, as well as it may reflect some actual strengths. But it, um, one of the things that we are concerned about in this gender bias is that, that if it's a perception of the student and we have some control of that and can encourage them to look again at science or math and to try to, to, to define their interests with more confidence, uh, we'd like to do that. And we just like not to have them foreclose some options which might be there for them. I think that that often comes out as far as these scores are concerned, that if the girls don't take the courses or anybody else for that matter doesn't take the course, uh, it's pretty hard to answer those questions. Uh, so that, that is always the first question to ask is what percentage do we have in the courses themselves. That of course is not so much the case at the eighth grade level, which is one of the reasons why you sometimes see a difference between eighth grade and eleventh grade. Moving on, um, we, we have a report from the middle school on the request for the eighth grade field trip. Uh, and uh, we have the principal here <coughs> to speak to that issue. Sure, I, I have a quick update on our wa walkway between our two portables too. Um, just that actually Dee LaBelle and I have been kind of working on this prior to um, Connie coming on board with us. and there was a pile of loam that we needed to get removed first. That has been moved and I talked with Dee as recently this morning before he went um, to Van Buren and he explained that he was in the midst right now of talking with Mr. McGovern to see if indeed we could get um, it hot topped there so that we could pass from one doorway to the other and to use that as a quick passageway especially for our seventh graders and he's going to get right back on that when he gets back next week. We look forward to having that accomplished by the next time we have a board meeting. So, and I know Connie, I hadn't had a chance to, to bring you up to date on that, but we have been working on that because it was an issue. It was one of those unfinished construction projects we wanted to get finished up. On the field trip issue, the, the reason I'm here is that about three weeks ago, I called Dr. Pelletier um, just to double check on the feasibility of our eighth grade going to Salem, Massachusetts, which they have done for at least the past two years. And he asked all the proper questions about it being part of the curriculum and was it budgeted? And I said yes, yes to both of those questions. And he said, well, we do have a policy that if it's an out-of-state trip, you need to come and be sure to ask the board's permission. So that's really what my intent is here, to just ask your permission for several out-of-state trips that we have on the docket. And I just would like to briefly explain those. The Salem trip, which the eighth grade team would like to take the eighth graders on on October 26th, um, really ties in with their social studies curriculum and how the hysteria around Salem impacted settlement in New England. And also at the same time, the language arts classes will be studying um, some of the stories from around that time um, in literature and also reading a book called The Visionary Girls, which is a historical fiction novel about some of the young ladies who were involved in some of the Salem witchcraft trials. The entire team goes on this. Um, we take two buses. Um, we have one bus driver and then two of our teachers actually job share the driving of the other bus. This helps us reduce the cost. They had planned for this in their budget. Um, we do have the money for it, but we just need permission to take the students out of state. It will be an extended school day for those students um, and we'll send all the proper things home. They'll be leaving approximately around 8 o'clock in the morning and we hope to have them all back by 5 o'clock that evening so that they will be back. So that's, that's one item. I don't know if you want to vote on these all in one group or if you would like me to talk about each one. We have, actually there are three that I'm going to talk to you about. Group or individual? Group is fine. Okay. Group. The next one, I, um, the seventh grade has budgeted in their plan to take the seventh grade to the Boston Museum of Science. They're not sure of an exact date at this point. They think sometime in November the team is still working out exactly when they would like to take them and then they will work that out with the transportation people. And this is really, it is a, a field trip that is more closely aligned with just our science curriculum but the entire team agrees to take them on this and they use it as a kickoff project for their science projects which the students begin working on and have due in mid-March I believe this year. So that's the other one. Once again, it's all been budgeted for. We just need your permission to take the students out of state. The third one 
is really an invitation that we have received and we don't have all of the information on it. Our middle school band under the direction of Tony Botha, our seventh and eighth grade band specifically, has been invited by the New England League of Middle Schools to perform at their conference in March in Hyannis. Uh, this is quite a unique um, invitation because this is the first time that the New England League of Middle Schools has invited anyone to perform outside of the immediate Hyannis area. Last year, Tony Boffett was able to go to that concert, a concert, yes, um, he was able to go to the conference and he heard the bands. And Tony's response was, our band is good, our band is better than this. And uh, Tony and, and Chris Toy were able to um, convince the people at the New, League, New England League of Middle Schools that indeed Cape Elizabeth should have a chance <coughs> to come down and, and show what kind of band they have. So they have been invited. We are hoping to have this be at absolutely no cost to our system. Um, it will involve two buses because we have a 75 member band and to get the members down there and the equipment we will need to have two buses and two bus drivers. Uh, we are in the midst of negotiations with the New England League of Middle Schools to have that be at no cost. That is a trip that was not budgeted for. Um, but it is a trip that I certainly compliment the band on being invited to do. Um, we certainly would like to see if we could get them there. And we will look for some extra funding in our budget, too, if, if we need to find that to support them. But that would be happening in March. I'm not sure of the exact date of the conference this year, but usually it's in the middle part of March. And it would be a one-day trip. They would travel down and back in one day. So those are the three trips to go out of state. Any questions? Yes. Two. You go first, Jan. Okay. Um, on all these trips, the buses are our school buses, is that right? That is correct. Okay. There was some confusion last year with other trips. Well, and, and I, I say that is correct because my understanding at this moment in time is that they would all be school buses. We have the school buses secured as long as we have your permission to go on October 26th. Last year, I believe the seventh grade ended up having to charter a bus uh, because when they wanted to go to the Boston Museum of Science, there was a conflict with some athletic events happening. We would certainly work very hard. We, real, we did not budget to charter a bus. So it would be our task to come up with a date that we could go to the Boston Museum of Science when we could use school buses. One of the other things that I heard parents talk about in conjunction with a trip to the Museum of Science is that it takes a day away from school, and most of our population of students have been to the Museum of Science a number of times. Is this really a, a, a necessary excursion for them or, or not? And I, and I apologize for not having as much thorough information on the seventh grade trip. I actually found out about this at a team leaders meeting today, and I wasn't sure if we would have time to present it to you in November uh, if they wanted to go like on November 5th or something like that. My understanding from the seventh grade team, Jan, is that they all support very much using this trip as a solid kickoff to the science project events and to helping students begin to think of some ideas for projects that they might want to investigate during this time and that they found it very profitable last year to take them, even though they would agree with you that many of the students have been to the Boston Museum of Science. Uh, but it is a trip that the entire team supports and all the, the teachers go. Uh, with that, and that's a decision that the seventh grade team has made as a group of planners to support this particular curriculum area. And, and my last question on the, the band trip, um, for the students remaining behind, would it be a regular school day and the band students would be expected to find out what they had missed and, and make up that work? Yes, it would be. Okay. Charlie? Jan had addressed one of my questions concerning the science fair project. Is this the one-time field trip for, the, for their school career, or is there other times that they go? To the Boston school? Museum of yeah. Science? It is the only time that they go during their middle school career, and I do not remember them going um, in fourth or fifth grade. I know last year neither the fourth or fifth grade went to the Boston Museum of Science. It also is the only field trip that the seventh grade goes on other than going to the the coast and doing some things along there which are just really short trips for us to do. Okay, the other, the other question I would have would be due to the, would be the band trip on the invitation of the New England League of Middle Schools. 
I would hate to approve something if I did not know what the funding was going to be. Right. I think Since it's not budgeted, I would table that particular yeah. motion. And, not and we would I be glad. Support it, right? Because I have two no. children that are in that band. Sure. But no, I, I appreciate that, and we we understand that. And I talked to Chris Toy last Friday, and he was waiting for another call from the New England New England <coughs> League of Middle Schools to see if they were indeed going to fund the entire time, the entire trip. So I would be glad to come back with this request when I have more specific information on that. Thank you. Okay, then uh, do I hear a motion that we approve the October 26th trip as presented? So moved. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, and the trip in uh, to Hyannis is tabled, but when it's a little clearer about the funding, you'll bring it back to us? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I just need a, a to an, an indication about the Boston Museum of Science trip. Yeah. Now, what do you want on the seventh grade trip? That's the November? That's, that's the November trip. It would be, once again, it's permission to take the students out of state to Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, you want a motion on that now, then? Do I hear such a motion? I move. Okay. Second? Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? That is budgeted, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. <coughs> okay, Connie, are you, do you have any other points that you'd like to make before I take uh, the gavel back, figuratively speaking? <laughs> I don't think so, except for the fact that I am prepared to talk at least a little bit on the uh, building project when you get down to that yourself. Okay, fine. Good. Okay, the next item on the agenda then is the board chairman's report. I think I may live to regret having put the budget update on the agenda automatically for every single meeting. Um, most of the time in, in the last few weeks uh, were spent on looking at the current budget and that of course was in the context of the shortfall which uh, of $110,000 which uh, occurred in the surplus carried over from last year and in the expenses which surrounded the events of September. And uh, a very preliminary analysis uh, showed us that we're basically okay so far. That's not to say that we have all the information that we'd like to have this early in the year but while we have advised the members of the administration to exercise some caution and some discretion in spending, we haven't felt it necessary to make any major changes at this time. As far as the budget going forward goes, we have made some uh, progress in getting everybody geared up or getting some of us geared up, uh, Connie and myself, uh, on Macintoshes and uh, the Excel program. Um, we hope to have everybody uh, working on that soon. Some of our members of the Administrative Council are going to take some instruction in that program. So we should, uh, we're putting in place the, the elements that we need to do some more sophisticated analysis that we've done in the past as to the different scenarios um, so when we get to the, uh, the budget process, I think we're going to have a, uh, a much easier time with it than we have in the past. Now let me stop there and see if any of the board members have any comments on uh, budget, either current or uh, future. Do you have any idea when we're going to get a final audit report? I don't know. That's, uh, that, that's I do have a notice I received today um, that there is a meeting with the um, manager, myself, and the other partner parties, Thursday morning at the auditor's office. Um, and uh, I assume that will be when we either get it or find out when mm -hmm. we're going to get it. Okay. Any other comments, Charlie? Since we do not have a, a business manager's report, I did have some questions. Can I forward those on to Connie for her to forward on to Dee? Mm -hmm. Please okay. do. Yeah. The next item is uh, the report on building projects and uh, of course with these absence uh, we won't be having that report. Although I would like to say that uh, 
I did personally inspect the storing of the trusses and uh, while there was a few hours more work to be done, uh, it did look to me as if, uh, and I am not an engineer nor a statistician, <laughs> that uh, they were strongly braced, uh, they will have been protected by a, by a fence. And I think that we have probably done all we can to avoid any accident taking place by uh, people going over the fence and climbing on them, and also any deterioration that they might suffer. They've been uh, stored in such a way so that there's adequate ventilation. Um, any board comment on, on building? Yeah. I was just going to ask, are, are we getting a final report <coughs> from Mr. Nadzo? Um, yeah, that is still in preparation, although I would draw everybody's attention to Mr. McGovern's uh, uh, report on the buildings which in which he outlines not only uh, a lot of events that uh, surrounded uh, the, uh, the various construction problems we had uh, this summer, but, but also a, uh, a strengthened uh, p program of inspection. And uh, I commend him for that and also for, uh, for having ended his, his essay, which is quite well written, with a quotation from William Wordsworth. And uh, I think anybody who is... Uh, interested in that subject should get uh, get a copy of that memorandum. It's dated September 18th. Uh, Mr. Nadzo's report is still being uh, prepared. However, I want to repeat what I've said in, in many other situations is that the whole subject of what happened with that particular construction project could possibly be a subject of litigation if a settlement is not reached uh, by the parties and therefore a lot of that part of it is not going to be uh, part of the public record it's going to be just by the school board in executive session only so while I know that's frustrating at this time for those who uh, would like to know more about it uh, we are constrained by by law and by just common sense not to discuss those issues publicly I was just going to comment on the uh, problem at the middle school on the uh, wall that had gotten saturated. Would you like me to? Yes, please. Briefly? Uh, I think there might be some questions in people's minds. Uh, two classrooms with a wall, uh, a non-load bearing wall, I believe, but anyway, it was a wall with wall boarding. Became saturated in a uh, rainstorm. I assume that was because the roof had some leaks. Exactly. The problem the roof, whatever the reason, the wall became saturated. They were out in the classroom, were removed. I put head class of their meantime, and then I'm sort of filling in with material that I wasn't here for, but that I have been updated on. And I came in, I guess, at the last act, but. Um, Northeast Test Consultants, which is a local uh, firm or a local in the greater Portland area that specializes in air quality control, was called in. I have worked with that firm, firm and I know them to be highly reputable and very capable. Uh, they gave us some uh, procedures that could be used in-house to both clean the wall in the case there was any presence of mold, as well as to initiate a procedure by which you use a humidifier to dry it out. Uh, and they also remove part of the wall in order to uh, accomplish, accomplish the uh, drying process. Uh, that whole process has been successfully completed. The odor is abated and the rooms are now being used. They, I have double checked with Northeast Test to see if we should be running any uh, air quality control tests. And right now, of course, since it's just been cleaned and dried out, there would be no or should be no problem with the mold. Uh, they do suggest that we give a double blaze just to make sure that the whole thing is still under control. But in the meantime, that issue seems to be uh, taken care of. What's to prevent it from happening again? Well, it was apparently triggered by a leak, and the roof has been fixed. That is, I understand the area uh, right above this classroom wall, this classroom wall. Uh, probably, from what I can understand, that the uh, uh, covering was abraded and uh, that has been taken out and replaced and in whatever rain we've had since then I believe it is not leaking so 
so long as we don't have any leaks, the wall should not uh, generate mold. Any other comments, Jan? Um, the engineers suggested to us last September that the middle school uh, had some minor problems that need to be that needed to be corrected before snow came to make it absolutely safe. Is that happening? That will absolutely be done. So that's scheduled or? Could I, I mean, I've had a lot of experience with roofs, so you might be interested in just a very, very quick uh, update of that kind of thing. Um, I did have a quick conversation with the people that were dealing with it to check my own understanding of that. What, uh, the only structure that was judged actually unsafe was the one that you've already taken down. The other pieces, and I'm not yet sure of exactly what steps we're talking about, the other pieces are certainly safe. The issue is that when the engineers are calculating dead load, they also then go ahead in the winter and calculate, calculate the various snow loads, slush loads, sleet loads, all the possibilities and their charts that they use, et cetera where it is, how it's landed, what the possibility of buildup, and so on. Um, th those numbers give a high margin of safety. And in case there is any borderline issue, they tell us if there is any snow on there more than two, four, six inches, and they'll be very specific about this, we would have the obligation of shoveling it off. If, in fact, there is something that can be done between now and the first snowfall, that will certainly be done. But just to make people understand that this is not something that is where the roof is teetery. It's a, a very safe roof situation as it stands, or they wouldn't allow us to use it. Uh, the snow load problem, just to be on the safe side, they sometimes give us uh, guidelines: two, snow, two inches, four inches, six inches, and that I definitely will be reviewing. With people. Yeah, the uh, the additional bracing is a couple of days' work on the uh, on the connector, on the link, and. Uh, there are a couple of other places where some two by fours or two by tens or two by sixes will be added, uh, but uh, the engineer is, is not at all worried about that uh, with the present dead load and additional wind load. But before the snow falls, we're going to do that. Mr. Chairman. <coughs> yes, sir. I'd like to take this time to, on behalf of the board, commend Charlie Freeman for the time and attention that he gave the weekend that that roof was removed. He was there for every moment of the deconstruction, and I believe he even videotaped it in case there were some repercussions. And I think we as a board should commend him for, for that extra effort that he put in on our behalf. Thank you for mentioning that, Charlie. You know, I was there part of that day, and every time I went down, he was there, so, with his video camera. The, um, Next item is the Career Ladder Study Committee report. Charlie? <coughs> okay, the Career Ladder Study Committee met on September 13th. Um, we addressed as our first priority uh, a review of the philosophy of the Career Ladder, and it was a consensus of the committee that, that the philosophy was intact, that it really didn't need any change, and it, it really, um, encompass the whole philosophy, whether it was just a career ladder um, evaluation process or whether it encompassed a um, um, the other salary structure that we have in place. Um, we will be meeting again on uh, this month that I haven't got the exact date. Pardon? Okay, next Wednesday. And uh, uh, we are going to be addressing uh, the focus of, we agreed on some focuses. One would be, should the career ladder be an optional program? What is the importance role of advanced degrees? Should the format be reconstructed? Should there be control of growth of the finances? And should everyone go through the evaluation process? So these were future focuses. Um, there were a couple of proposals that have come from administrators on possible changes or refinements, and those will also be looked at.
Questions? Thank you, Charlie. Jan, uh, would you report on the superintendent search committee? Yes, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, the board and Dr. Goldman met with Paul Brunel from the Maine School Management Association at a public workshop last Thursday night. Um, Mr. Brunel gave us an overview of how to organize a search for a permanent superintendent and talked to us about many of the legalities involved in such a search. Uh, he was very helpful. He gave us important information regarding timelines, application procedures, general procedures, advertising, screening procedures, and a selection process. Um, after that, I met with Dr. Goldman, who helped me start to define a timeline for Cape Elizabeth. And the next steps we're going to take um, are that John Holt is developing an ad to be placed uh, in the appropriate magazines. And I will be talking um, with a couple of consultants uh, to see what they offer and, and how much um, they would charge for their services. This doesn't mean that we will be using a consultant, but we need to be clear what all of our options are. Um, I'm also hoping to arrange a meeting with some of the board members um, from other school boards in the area that have recently done superintendent searches to see what worked well for them and what, and what didn't work. The board will have another workshop probably next week um, to list all the options and to set the procedure that we'll use for our search in Cape Elizabeth. Um, so by the next board meeting, I should be able to report exactly what that procedure will be. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Jan. The uh, next item on the agenda is the appointment uh, to the School Space Study Committee. Uh, First of all, let me say that uh, we were gratified that uh, there were a number of people who submitted applications to serve on this uh, committee, and uh, you know we thank all of them for for having taken the taken the time and trouble. We're going to appoint two tonight, and I'd just like to say that the others uh, may be appointed by the town council as we. Uh, we shared the pool of applications a little bit. So Jan, do you have a, a recommendation for us? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. I would like to recommend that we appoint Joyce Freeman and Nancy Singer to be our school board representatives um, to the School Space Study Committee. Okay, do I hear a second? Second? Any discussion? Could we, we, have, a little, could we have a little biographical do we have any kind of little biographical thing about those two people? Oh, can we have a <laughs> little? Uh, I, I did can you do bring it. the resumes? <laughs> no. I don't know. I guess you can't, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, uh, I can, Charlie. Joyce Freeman is a teaching principal at uh, at South Portland. She uh, she lives in uh, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, Nancy Sanger is on the planning and uh, zoning board. That's right. Uh, that tells she people at least both. a little bit. I didn't realize I was <laughs> planning or zoning. One, one of them, which is it? Um, Na Nancy's on one of those and has a real interest in this area mm -hmm. because of her uh, yes. working yeah. with us through our portables. She has mm -hmm. no children in the school system at this time. Mm -hmm. that I can assure you that we, Charlie, that we did read all the resumes. <laughs> no, I understand. We just didn't commit this them to the memory. No, this is for <laughs> some little biographical <laughs> sketch of who they are. Yes. <laughs> Next time we make an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the next appointment that I'd like to make, and I think I get to make this, is to appoint you, the member of the, uh, uh, to represent the school board. You volunteered for that, correct? Yes. Now, shall I uh, describe your biography, or would you like to do that? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Uh, Charlie is uh, appointed by the school board, if I hear a motion to that effect. So moved. We already have a motion, motion. on the floor. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, and it yeah. has been seconded. Thank you. Okay, been seconded. Any further discussion on our request for biographical I'm sorry I distracted you. That's okay. You always get me that way. <laughs> All in favor? Okay. Thank you. I move that Charles Greer be our uh, representative from the board on the School Space Study Committee. Thank you, John. Do I see a second? A second. Is there any discussion? Do we have any button? Never mind. <laughs> 
Okay, all in favor, we're going to vote on this one right away. There we go. It's unanimous. Abstain, Charles? I abstain. <laughs> I uh, also uh, would like to announce uh, that uh, the chairman of the town council and I have uh, jointly appointed uh, Jeff White to be the chairman of this committee. Jeff White uh, is a, uh, an attorney. Uh, he's well known to many of us and uh, the chairman of the town council and I have great confidence in his ability to, to lead this committee in its important work. On to new business. Now, we have uh, three appointments to make. The first is to the PRVTC General Advisory Board, which uh, used to be known as the SMVTI General <coughs> Advisory Board, I believe. And uh, I would uh, ask that somebody nominate me to that uh, board, if you so wish. <laughs> I move that Peter Leslie be our representative on the uh, PRVTC General Advisory Board. Second. Okay. All, any discussion? <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's four to the one abstention. Uh, the next committee is the Affirmative Action Committee, and uh, I would entertain a motion that John Holt be appointed to that uh, committee. I move that John Holt be appointed Affirmative Action Committee member. Second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any uh, discussion? All in favor? And finally, the sabbatical committee, uh, I would entertain a motion that Loretta Pond continue to be the board member on that committee. So moved. Moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? The next uh, item, Charlie, the drug uh, certification. Okay, we received a uh, notice on July 5th of uh, an awareness by the, by the state that to be in compliance with federal reg regulations that there were certain prerequisites for, that had to be met in order to receive the federal funds that are dispersed by the state for, for drug and alcohol awareness and education. Um, those had to be responded, I believe, by September 4th. I believe that that was done by Dr. Pelletier. So we, we are in compliance. And it had to be done before October 1st. So essentially clarifying that we have policies in effect that, that essentially broadly meet the, the, the recommendations and and uh, requirements of the, of the federal government and the state. We are lax at, in one area. We do not have a K through eight policy, or we don't have a general school policy. And my recommendation to the board, instead of creating another committee, I believe that this is something that could be handled by the community team. They have a committee which, which had on their agenda as a, a K through eight policy, they could review the existing school policies, come up with a recommendation of a policy. I could bring it back to the board for your recommend for your consideration. I know we have a heavy heavy agenda. Um, it is very important that that we meet all requirements, and if we don't, we could lose the federal funds, and we could also lose some other federal funds because because of the, of the federal's requirement. So that is my recommendation. Do you need a motion? Have you talked to the community team? I'm on the community team, oh, and that, that has been one of my agendas <laughs> <laughs> to bring, bring back to the board. <laughs> She's fighting the fight for my argument for I was going to ask that question. <laughs> And, and, I, and I'm, also, I'm also on that committee, the K-8 policy, and I'm also chairman of that committee. So. Well, I assume that you can take it up with the committee then. There won't be any problem getting that passed. But you I, I need board, board authorization to proceed. Okay. Do we, we need a motion uh, to authorize Charlie to proceed? 
I move that we authorize uh, Charlie and the community team to uh, draft a program for K through eight and a school wide uh, drug program and alcohol policy abuse program. State. Policy statement. Policy statement. Excuse yeah. me. Okay. It's been moved and did I see a second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, the next item on the agenda, I believe, is uh, Mr. Richard Page. Is that? Yes. Just like to thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. And welcome, Connie. And best of luck. And may you keep us out of the newspapers. Um, I would like to say a. Uh, I normally don't get up and speak. I did once before about, oh, six, seven months ago, and we were talking about the, um, the Living Skills Program and Industrial Arts. And when I've been reading in the paper and seeing what's been going on in the town, uh, I attended a meeting about two weeks ago because of my concern about the resignation of Dr. Pelletier. Um, again, when I, I went to this meeting, I had heard that he had gotten his salary for the full year of $71,000. And at that meeting, I received a copy of his contract, uh, his resignation contract, I assume it's called. And as being a taxpayer of this town, I was appalled to read the information in this contract, and I truly questioned whether the board was acting in the best interest of the town of Cape, <coughs> town of Cape Elizabeth. And uh, Peter, since you signed the contract, uh, I'd just like to, and the board may enter in, and I'm sure they will. I looked uh, at the contract and looked at how much we are going to pay him for his full year of employment with Cape Elizabeth. I don't know whether a lot of people realize it, but with his compensation for sick pay, with his vacation pay, uh, my calculations read about $97,000 for, for his last full year of contract with us. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, am I about correct? It's uh, from the date of his resignation, the amount, uh, again, speaking from memory, is approximately $78,000. Okay, and if you include a quarter of his salary has already been paid, so his first year, or his whole year, is around $97,000, if I'm not correct. I think that uh, you're probably correct on the arithmetic. Okay. I don't agree in the concept because uh, obviously <laughs> the gentleman uh, you know, worked until that day. OK. OK, so we're paying him $80,000 uh, not to work. Um, I noticed that in, in, your, in the contract, I just highlighted some areas. Um, while we're paying him his $81,000 for the rest of his contract, uh, he is being and, and obviously encouraged to pursue other endeavors. Which uh, I beg your pardon? Where does it say that? Uh, it says to permit Pelletier to pursue other endeavors. Oh. In other words, we're paying him so he can go get another job. No, I, guess I, I just disagreed with the use of the word encourage. Uh, okay. Well, that, it's in the contract, so I assume it's allowing that, uh, and encouraging him. That's all I'm saying. It's here in writing, okay, and it's allowing him to do so. It also says, though, that, that he has to be available to us as a consultant, so technically it's not true that he's being encouraged to pursue other industries. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Jan, because um, number four says, we'll provide his professional services to the board. Is that what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. At no additional compensation. That kind of swung me a little bit because they're already paying him $81,000 to basically not do anything other than consult. I have to be careful because item, item 11 on what I say can put me in a very precarious situation. Um, he's also continuing, I assume, uh, from your contract to gather, uh, again, that cash settlement in Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Uh, the question I ask on that end of it, which I think is around $9,000, is that the total amount that he would normally receive for Blue Cross Blue Shield and retirement and what have you? 
You know, I've, I've got to say that not knowing that this would be on the agenda, I did not uh, bring those numbers with me. I don't believe any uh, well, board I, member did. I, I'm wondering if it's the 100%. I'm but, saying is it the total amount? Let me, if I can, if I can, Richard, one thing. What you have in the separation agreement, or the, the as you call it, the, the, the last contract that we signed with Dr. Pelletier, represents uh, the, his, his th end of his three-year contract with us. We had a three-year contract that was signed two and a half years ago with Dr. Pelletier that was due to expire June 30th, 1991. Mm -hmm. All the things that you're pointing out, and I've made this comment to the press, I've made this comment to people who have called me, all the things that you're pointing out were all part of his original contract. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't anything that he received in allowing him to step down from his position for the rest of the year uh, that is not already was not already agreed to uh, over two and a half years ago in his contract. There were any added inducements. There weren't any added incentives. There was nothing additional put into the contract that wasn't already in his original contract. Okay. The problem that, that I'm obviously having with this whole program is if you have a 20, 25 year employee executive in a corporation and that ed individual resigns or you would like that individual resign, a lot of times you do get a very nice what they call the golden parachute. We're talking about a three-year employee that has received what I consider the golden parachute. It's a five-year employee. A five-year employee, but how long has he been with us? Four and a half Four years. Four and a half years. Well, that's Four still not 20 years. Uh, and that really bothers well, me from you had a business contract, standpoint. You had a legally binding contract with an individual, okay. whether it was for one year, five years, 20 years, or 30 years. But he wasn't fired from what I can read here. He resigned. But still you insisted on continuing with his contract. Uh, are you a lawyer by any chance? Obviously not. Have you, uh, have you or the Concerned Citizens Group uh, consulted a, a no, lawyer I to? Well, I, I would suggest you do that, uh, frankly. Uh, some of this we cannot discuss publicly, and it's not appropriate to discuss publicly. I would be pleased to, to uh, discuss it with you in a different forum. And uh, I was somewhat surprised that nobody from the Concerned Citizens Group called me. Uh, to discuss it, but I think you no, need... No, Peter, I think you, what uh, I am a concerned citizen, no. not a concerned citizen group, and a concerned taxpayer. I'm sorry, so I thought you were... You, 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 use the, you, okay. you are not representing the so-called concerned citizens group that I have read about in the newspaper. I'm representing Richard Page from Fine. 54 okay. Hunts Point Road. I have spoken to a, a large number of lawyers, and uh, Cape Elizabeth is, uh, uh, has a large number of lawyers. Um, I think that uh, that is something that you also should do and anybody else who was concerned about this uh, contract because contract law in the labor area is a highly specialized field. And I can tell you that this board spent a lot of time with its lawyer uh, who represents, uh, is, is a member of a, a large law firm in Portland that represents uh, a lot of school boards around the state, and we educated ourselves in this area. And that having gone through that education <coughs> process, uh, we then considered all the alternatives, and we took the action that we took. And no school board member suggested that we take any other action. It was a unanimous vote of five members of the school board who spent a lot of time on the subject, five members who were elected in three different competitive elections, you know, five very different people. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I am still looking at an individual that is not working for this town anymore, and is, could there have been another alternative to taking care of this problem? And you're telling me from the board standpoint that would have been impossible. And I'm saying that I'm uh, looking I at I didn't that. say that. I said the board considered the issue and all the alternatives with a great deal of care and deliberation, advised every step along the way by the board's attorney, and then the board took that action. I'm not saying that no other action was impossible. In fact, the other night on television in Issues and Answers, uh, I described some of the alternatives very briefly. I, I would just say from my standpoint, I felt like it was of the least cost to the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth to have acted in the way that we did. It was the, the cheapest way that we could honor uh, our commitment. I really, I really have, again, 
from being from a business standpoint and looking at the way uh, other people are resigned, which this is a resignation, he was not fired, uh, and that's how it reads, that he's been given that length of time, uh, along with his sick pay, along with his, uh, with his vacation pay. Well, uh, why wasn't his contract written to end and then have, it, have his sick pay and his vacation pay continue till his anniversary date? I understand that. Well, the contract was written uh, two and a half years or two and a third years previous. This contract was written, I oh, think, that September 7th. That, that contract is merely an extension, as reiterating what John said, of the obligations of this school board which were embodied in the contract signed two years ago, a little more than two years ago. That contract that you have, the extension, is nothing more than a reaffirmation of those obligations. As John said, not one thing was added on to it. Okay. What would have been the cause or how could he have been gotten out of the, exi the last contract? One of the things that uh, is inappropriate for us to discuss is that issue. Public employees are protected in a certain number of ways, as are certain employees in the private sector. We may not conduct public trials. We may not conduct hypothetical trials. It's just not appropriate. Okay. Um, I'd also like to go through some of the other issues on the contract uh, that, that, that really concern me. Um, the Again, going back to the cash payments, which, you know, hit the papers, and um, one employee of the town asked for that to be done and said that that isn't done before it hit the papers, uh, as far as that's concerned. But when you give somebody a benefit, in my opinion, a benefit is a benefit, as defined. Um, very few companies will give the total cash amount for that benefit to an employee if they so ask. They might give partial of it. Uh, and I think you should consider that in the future of offering a superintendent or any employee an opportunity to say if, they're, if it costs the town $9,000, they have an option. We will pay whatever, $1,000 or $2,000 in cash in their paycheck, but not the total amount. Well, the plan that we had is a plan that existed in this town, as I understand it, for more than 10 years. And I don't know if you heard the auditor speaking to that subject. But basically, he said that many school boards, and as well as several cities, and I probably shouldn't name which ones they are, but I do know which they are, uh, also followed this practice. Uh, what failed to happen and was wrong was that uh, I think in 1986 when the tax law was changed and these so-called cafeteria plans uh, were, you know, had their status changed, then Cape Elizabeth uh, School Department failed to issue W-2 forms to those few employees that were taking cash in lieu of benefits. And it was a perfectly proper cafeteria plan uh, and common it had existed here for many years, existed in many surrounding communities, and you may well be right that uh, one could structure the plan differently. That would be subject a subject for negotiations with the uh, employees involved, and uh, you know perhaps that will be you know, on the agenda. Be, there could be thousands of dollars to the benefit of the town in offering well, something like that. Well, remember the. Uh, let's take a high. There's a, an example where we can take a hypothetical case. Let's say an employee uh, can take $3,000 in cash or have us send a $3,000 check to Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then we say, well, we're going to change that. You can uh, take uh, $1,000 in cash or we'll send a $3,000 check to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, that employee can go home, discuss it with his or her spouse, and uh, reverse the way they were taking their health care and their uh, benefits, and they'll come back and say, hypothetically, uh, all right, send the check for $3,000 to uh, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Mm -hmm. And then the other spouse goes to uh, his or her employ <coughs> employer and says, I would now like to take this benefit in cash under your cafeteria plan. In any event, I don't think this discussion is related to 
the contract that uh, you true. have in your hand. I think it's an issue it's an for issue negotiation. Issue seriously consider. We do intend to comply, and probably already are, if uh, the business manager were here tonight, he would probably confirm that we are now, we've now gone back to January 1st, 1990, and have, uh, uh, does somebody know the answer to that question? Can I make a point on the one you are just making there? On this one here? Well, the, the item of the cafeteria. My name Could you Tom, identify yourself? My name is Tim Thompson, and I, I'm no. a citizen of the no. uh, Cape, Cape Elizabeth. The question I'd like to address, uh, Peter, is the one that you just brought up. The way you characterized that change in 86, it seemed to indicate that maybe the school uh, has a responsibility in the way that was done when the change was made that you didn't, uh, well, is, that, I, is that what you're basically saying? Well, I think, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, we failed to pick up uh, that particular regulation. And uh, also, if you were here when the auditor was speaking, he described in some detail how that uh, particular item, it only involved a few employees, slipped through their random audit procedures. And it was only because I asked them last spring to make sure that we were complying with all municipal, state, and federal regulations and to audit certain areas 100%, did they find it? Or if not 100%, at least uh, uh, much more rigorously. Well, let me ask my hypothetical question then, if I might. Under item 11, where we've agreed in your contract extension uh, for Dr. Pelletier to provide legal assistance, if this matter created a legal problem for him, uh, it's difficult for me to understand. Now, this is my business, but it's difficult for me to understand how taking money and not having it reported over a number of years is a difficult concept for people to understand. Uh, I don't know how many of you on the, the board do that, but uh, most of the people I talk to certainly understand when you get something, you normally have to pay taxes on it. But if that were to create a problem for Dr. Pelletier, uh, is it the board's feeling that item 11 would protect him and we'd have to provide him with legal assistance in resolving that dispute? I don't believe so. That's, uh, that was not something that uh, he did in the discharge of his duties. Uh, although I'm not a lawyer, I, I'm not sure I'm answer, I, that that is the correct answer to that question. But let me state that that clause that uh, has drawn so much comment is pretty much standard boilerplate that uh, our school board council has put into contracts in many, many other cases where school superintendents have resigned. And council pointed out to us uh, more than once that that right to defense exists independent of that clause. That exists by statute. Well, I wonder if that clause would exist uh, in the event that uh, one of the employees of the town, not Dr. Pelletier, but one of the other employees in the administration uh, area that was utilizing that same cash and not reporting uh, activity, were to sue the town. You know, we don't know for sure. Uh, we don't have any proof that, that it wasn't reported in some other way. I think it's a big uh, conclusion to make that, that because a W-2 form wasn't issued here, that that, that income was not reported at all. I think that's that, unfair That's not been to determined them. at this point yet, Jan? Well, we don't have we don't, access to our employees' IRS. personal income tax that's returns. Our, that's the IRS. It's between the employees and the IRS. Well, did we, as a town, provide them with the W-2 for that income? I think that's been well established that with regard to that specific yeah. income for a period of time, we did not. Okay. Well, it, it, and again, I guess why, why it would be reported, how, how would we, would we be reported or why it would be reported if there had not been a W-2? Well, my something. goodness, people, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm a, in business for myself, and uh, I would say that... Uh, I get uh, income from a number of different sources, which does not have to be reported. People uh, pay me for my advice, and they send me a check, as they would a lawyer. Uh, and I don't get any W-2 form, but it sure as heck goes on my income tax return. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just, on, under item 11, I wondered if you felt in the drafting of that, that was something we as a town would have to provide no. uh, legal assistance for that matter. No, I don't, in defending a person uh, in uh, connection with their own personal tax return is certainly not included in that. We but there are other members of the administration that were utilizing that practice. 
Yes. And Employees no. have an obligation to report their income. Did we have other people in the administration that were getting tax-free benefits? Well, excuse me, you're, you're mischaracterizing this. They're not tax-free benefits. They received benefits in cash uh, under a cafeteria plan which we had, which was a fairly normal cafeteria plan that had one defect, that for a period of time, neither we nor the auditors picked up the fact that W-2 forms had not been issued. Whether or not the employee declared that income on his or her personal return is not known to us. We failed to file the W-2 in two or three cases. That's all that happened. That doesn't mean that those people did not file their income tax correctly. A lot of people take their checkbook at the end of the year and see how much money they got. They take their W-2s. They take the statement from the bank. And they take their uh, statement from whatever sources they have, which may or may not have 1099s or W-2s, and they prepare their income tax. Do we have an ongoing liability in that regard as a town? For that, for those non -reporting. No, I don't believe we do. I'm, again, not a tax lawyer, but... We don't lawyer, have Social Security to pay my understanding employers. We don't have workman's compensation uh, percentages to no, pay. Uh, no, no. I, we, I think you're, you're wrong on that one. We have... If we paid them money and we didn't report it and we didn't pay Social Security, we didn't make contributions of all the other sorts that we have to make on that money, I don't see how we, we do not have some kind of ongoing liability that's got to be resolved. But... Uh, um, and I don't think I'm wrong, but uh, I think it's well, something we should check into. It, it's certainly, uh, you know, it's certainly something we'll check into. It's my understanding there's nothing, uh, you know, further that has to be done other than the correct deficiency, which has been done. Okay. Uh, I look at, uh, obviously, uh, item 10 in the contract. Uh, basically relieved the board from any problems from Pelletier, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure of that. Item 11 really concerns me, which he brought well, up. Well, let me well. just comment, since you brought that up, uh, those are what are known as mutual releases, mm -hmm. whereby each side releases the other against any future claims or actions. I noticed it didn't release the, um, the town of Cape Elizabeth. Just the school board. We represent the town of Cape Elizabeth. I think that's a separate body, is it not? It doesn't have anything to do with the school board. The school, yeah. has, school, uh, the school board acts as an independent okay. body. Okay, fine. Uh, item 11, uh, and why I'm really concerned on why I should talk my true feelings on a lot of the situations, is that if I did say something that could have been, could be construed as liable, and Dr. Pelletier heard me on TV or what have you, uh, obviously, he could sue. Uh, item 11, from what I can read it, says that the town's going to pay him to sue me or pay the legal fees to sue me. That concerns me. No, that is not, that is not the interpretation. Um, board shall also provide Pelletier legal counsel in any present or future proceedings relating to incidents within the scope of his employment. He is still employed here. Concerning the tenure of Cape Elizabeth and should separate legal counsel be required by bar rules. Um, so I'm kind of held here a little bit in saying some of my feelings about the situation with Dr. Pelletier uh, and his re resignation because of paragraph 11. And I think that's atrocious, that, right. a, that a taxpayer can't get up and has to be concerned that my concern is the town of Cape Elizabeth and that if I say something here against the past superintendent, that he can sue me with my money. Well, uh, I don't that think... That seems a little crazy to me. I, I don't think that is uh, the interpretation. Uh, and uh, <laughs> again, I think that uh, this is perhaps a case where if you <coughs> felt that you wanted to unburden yourself publicly, you should have sought counsel uh, in advance of isn't that, that so that, that you Peter, would know. Isn't that, isn't that kind of crazy that, uh, that I can't come here and talk about a public employee uh, openly to the town without I, having to worry to be sued by that individual and that individual's legal counsel is being paid by the town. Well, I don't, I don't believe that that is uh, the proper interpretation. Are you absolutely sure? No, I'm not absolutely sure. First of all, I'm not a lawyer. Peter, you signed the document. Excuse me. Uh, 
I signed the document, of course. I'm chairman of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. Uh, there was a unanimous motion on behalf of the, uh, of the school board to sign that contract. We were advised by counsel, uh, and it's my understanding, but I cannot tell you, you know, absolutely, certainly, because uh, uh, anything can be tested in the courts, but my understanding is, and I believe it's an accurate one, is that any public employee, and this includes us as board members, anything that we do in the faithful discharge of our duties, we are acting uh, in the case of a state employee under what's called the color of state law. And as long as what we're doing is not criminal, uh, and it's not uh, fraud of a criminal, I mean, then our employer, the body which we serve, either as employees or as volunteers, has the obligation to protect us in court against actions that people take against us when we have been faithfully discharging our duties. Should the superintendent, be it Connie Goldman or uh, Dr. Pelletier or anybody else, be sued in connection with his or her duties, his employer, her employer, must defend that employee. Yeah, I hear you. And I'm saying that the, what, what I am up here talking about, Peter, and, and thank you very much for explaining that, is that my hands are tied because I'm not sure of, of, of a legal interpretation, and neither are you. I think your uh, hands are tied because here in America we don't conduct public trials in, I'm not, I'm in not, a forum which is to, informal. If Peter, I'm not trying to conduct a, uh, a public trial. What I am trying to find out from the school board and yourself is how in, in consciousness, for, for the betterment of this town, with the, with the restraints we have on our budget, with the decisions that these people are going to have to make this coming year, you can give somebody, ask for their resignation, and say you've got $97,000. By the way, you don't have to come to work. But if we need you, we'll call on you. And in the middle of this, it says very nicely, and we won't compensate you if we call on you once a month, Jim. And that's what I'm saying. I can't understand how somebody can resign. If he was fired, I can understand it. If he resigned, truly resigned, how you can come up with a contract like this? Well, let me say that I think that the decision we made... When did he actually made, resign, by the way? Let me finish. The decision we made was very, very much a conscious decision. And let me repeat, it was made by five elected representatives who spent a lot of time studying this issue. And it was by mutual agreement with Dr. Pelletier. Okay. I, I can understand why he'd agree. Uh, Loretta, I, I really can. I mean, I'd love this type of a, of a separation agreement. Uh, would you really? No, you would. Would I really? really? Let me ask you another question because I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Because has there and is there a letter of recommendation that is, that is somewhere for Dr. Pelletier within? Was there any other document that handed that was handed to Dr. Pelletier as a letter of recommendation from the school board? By whom? By the school board. Not to my knowledge. No. There's no letter of recommendation no. uh, that went along with this. For what uh, it would have to be public record. Pardon me? It would, if it were, it would have to be public record. It was not mm. public record. Okay. Well, that's, that's a question that I figured I'd ask. Um, I really feel, from looking at this, and, and Peter, uh, since you did sign it, and I, I feel that it is not in the best interest of the town, I think you should step down as chairman of the school board and, uh, and give that position to somebody else. Uh, I feel it's not signed in good consciousness, as far as I can see. Um, I can't believe. Now, we have Connie here, who's filling in for Dr. Pelletier, uh, who we're paying, um, I assume, Connie, we're paying Connie, I know we are, for the remainder. I mean, that's a hundred, and it's gotta be a hundred and sixty, hundred and seventy thousand dollars swing. And we're worried about whether we're going to keep living skills next year. A lot of programs are in this contract. Excuse and me, Dick. Yeah. Let me just ask. Let me just try to cut this off a little bit with being polite. 
You can be, you don't have to be. Well, I'm going to be polite because that's, that's my fine. nature. That's good. You've got five people here who've been elected to serve the best interests of the town, not our own personal interests, to serve the best interests of the town. We took an oath to that effect. I resent the implications that you're making. I resent on Peter's behalf you're asking for his resignation. You have absolutely no legal right to ask for it, and I think you're out of line. John. I'm going to say that on behalf of Peter. So let me finish. We've let you talk tonight. I've just about had it with the attitude in this town that the five people who have dedicated more hours than you will ever know to make this program work as well as possible and listen to the phone calls that we get in support, I might add. Of I haven't had I, that. that. Absolutely. Dick, I haven't had one phone call about that. Mm -hmm. Not one. Nobody on this board has had any phone calls about this at all? I had that one. This was a, that this was a poor? I had one. Contract. We decided based you all, you all feel that the people in this town feel, John, that this Dick, they world, Dick, if they don't, they have the right to vote us out. That's right. election next oh, May. That's absolutely correct. There will be at least two, if not four, people up for election. I hope to see your name on the ballot to put your money where your mouth is. Because it's a lot easier to stand out there behind that podium than to sit in a room at 11 or 12 o'clock at night and determine the fate of the school system and the people that we employ to run it. John, I think that's a great speech, and I understand where you're coming from with that speech. Then I look and forward I to seeing the ballot in I, do, I, do, I do have a lot of respect for everybody on the school board. Okay? I don't have respect for what was signed here. That's your right. That's, that, that's, that's why I'm here. You're right. That's my tax dollars, John. That's absolutely right. Okay? And you've made your and point I don't think very it's spent clear. wisely. You've made your point, made your Dick. Point. And okay. John, let, let, let me point out something else. There are a lot of people within this town that do give a lot of their time but it might not be an elected position that they give it to. I'm not okay. comparing an elected official so, as opposed so to an appointed when official. You, when you point the finger at certain people within this town, don't think that they don't give up their, ta their time in other areas, okay? I hold you people up and I hold you responsible for what happens to this town and to this school. And I just noticed that Frank Miles got up and said that we're down. Now, our tax money is supposed to be improving our education, and over the last five years, our aggregate is down, okay? So that's what I'm talking about, and that superintendent was on board here when that happened. Okay, Mr. Page, you have expressed yourself we are more than once on this subject. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, frankly, uh, this board has listened uh, you know, very patiently to you and to others. I don't want to give you or anybody else a civics lesson uh, or sound patronizing in any way, but I okay, don't, I excuse me, let me finish, me. let me don't finish. Don't insult me, Peter, by saying that, okay? Mm -hmm. You have insulted me and this board by saying that we made an unconscious decision, and you have repeated that after I have assured you that we spent hours and hours, we researched cases of contractual law of public employees in this state and in others advised by very competent counsel. And you have done nothing similar to that. You don't know in this subject what you are talking about. And that is a simple fact. And you should go and find out before you get up and ask for resignations. And incidentally, I signed, yes, I happen to be the chairman at this moment, but every single member of this board voted for that agreement. Now, I think we've exhausted the possibilities of this subject, and I would ask you please to sit down. I will speak with you anytime privately and meet with any concerned citizens at any reasonable time to discuss this. There's okay. no... Peter, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, it doesn't change the feelings that I have about the contract. I want you to, you know, obviously you're going to know that. Um, and we have a tough budget time coming up. Keep this in the back of your mind. That Mr. The Page, $7,000 out the window. We have Before exhausted the possibility of this subject. I thank you. The next time. subject on the agenda is the school board approval for Mary Bruns to serve as representative and Nancy Hutton as alternate representative on the Administrator Recertification Renewal Planning Committee. Do I hear a motion to that effect? I so move. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Is there any other 
business to um, come before the board tonight. I entertain uh, Charlie. Uh, can I just confirm that we have a school board administrative council workshop on the 12th from 8 to 11. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I have to be out of town that day, and I discussed it with, uh, with Connie Goldman, uh, moving it back one week to the 19th. Does that fit everybody's schedule? I was unclear about the moving back. I did let the administrators know that you would not be there this Friday. Uh, so I don't know what their availability is on the 19th. They're looking as if that's a problem. The 26th, Friday the 26th. I cannot be there. <coughs> yeah, why don't you go ahead without me? Let me let. Well, okay. On the 12th. For, for so the, on the 12th. 12th? Or the 12th. That's this Friday. That's Friday. That's Friday. And that would be at 9 o'clock? Eight, eight we had it 8 to 11. Whoops. Okay, well, <coughs> we're at 9. I have another. It's 8 to 10, I think. Eight to ten. Okay. Eight to ten. Eight to ten. Looking this better all the time. <laughs> this is this Friday. Boy, that's three appointments within an hour. I don't know. Connie, we thought that was your problem when we hired you. Can you handle three appointments in an hour? Okay. okay. Well, I mean, not at the same time. <laughs> all right. Then you people will go ahead and meet the night. Well, is. That's fine. Next one is new. Okay. Any other business? Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Thing.